I'd like to welcome everyone again to the 37th annual CCS Symposium and the first of the afternoon sessions entitled Economics, Youth, and Technology in the Arab Spring. I will let my friend and colleague, Professor Ted Swedenberg, take it from here. Thanks. Welcome to the uh, Rafiq Hariri building and to Ashab Yurid Scott in Nizam. I'm Ted Swedenberg. It's my great privilege to be uh, at Georgetown at CCAS for the year as a visiting professor and visiting scholar. And it's my great honor to uh, chair this session this afternoon, Economics, Youth, and Technology in the, quote, Arab Spring. And we'll start off, without further ado, with Professor Joel Bainan of Stanford University talking about what have workers gained from Egypt's January 25th, in quotes, revolution. Because this is uh, short, I want to make four uh, points before uh, that I won't have time to make in any detail. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about workers, obviously, but I don't want to be understood as making uh, a narrow class argument as a comprehensive explanation for what happened in Egypt uh, or anywhere else. Although I would make the argument that in Tunisia and Egypt, Tunisia even more than Egypt, um, workers were a particularly important element of the social forces that uh, toppled the two autocrats. Uh, second, uh, the broad conceptual framework of what I'm talking about, um, I have argued elsewhere, so I won't make the argument here, is that uh, an extended analysis of uh, Egypt and the Arab world in the neoliberal era, going all the way back to the 1970s, so I'm a historian, that's how I think, I apologize. Um, but that argument is an argument that has developed in the pages of Middle East Report uh, and elsewhere. And if I'm not mistaken, Judith Tucker, who is sitting in the front, wrote one of the very first articles that I read about that. Um, so, and the second part of the theoretical apparatus that I'm not going to talk about is uh, my critique and response to social movement theory. So I, I do think that it's useful, but not in its classical form, but I'm not going to talk about that. And um, the fourth thing that I'm not going to talk about, and this I just axed out of the paper when I saw that it'll take me too long uh, to, to read through it, um, is gender. And this is actually uh, one of the, this is a big loss um, because it's one of the most important things that's uh, changed is that um, the poorest working women uh, have seen some uh, really amazing uh, social changes where they have stepped up and become spokespersons for uh, strikes, including men. Um, so I won't talk about that. I've written about it elsewhere, and when this paper is published, that will be in it. So the baseline for what I want to say is that uh, under the radar screen of most Western observers of all sorts was that from 1998 until 2010, uh, there were somewhere between 3,400 and 4,000 strikes, sit-ins, protests, and other workers' collective action in Egypt uh, between 1998 and 2010. So roughly uh, a little bit over uh, a decade. This was the largest and most sustained Arab civil social movement in uh, over uh, 50 years. Um, I'm excluding here the armed struggles for national liberation. And this uh, movement, this social movement, and this is the social movement theory part which I'm not going to develop, uh, are developed without any support whatsoever from the official Egyptian Trade Union Federation, which was, uh, since it was established in 1957, an arm of the state. Uh, the Egyptian Trade Union Federation, which I'll call ETOF uh, for short, I apologize for the acronym, um, accepted the, uh, the neoliberal economic and rest uh, restructuring and stabilization program that Egypt signed with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in 1991. And uh, more importantly to this immediate story, uh, it uh, made no objection to the installation of the government of businessmen led by Prime Minister Ahmed Nazif in July 2004. So there they all are. Uh, Nazif's mandate was to accelerate the neoliberal transformation of the economy and the sell-off of the public sector. And assisted by Western educated PhDs and corporate CEOs who occupied the economic ministries in his cabinet, he was largely successful. 
Workers responded almost immediately to Nazif's policies by escalating strikes and other collective actions. So uh, from 1988 uh, to 1993, there was an average of uh, 27 strikes for year, per year. And from 1998 till 2003, there was an average of 118 strikes per year. But in 2004, there were 265 collection, collective actions, over 70% of them uh, after the Nazif government took office in July. And these actions were centered at first in the textile industry, uh, but by 2007 had spread to every sector of the economy. They started largely in the public sector, but by the end of the decade, uh, private sector uh, collective actions comprised 40% or so of the total. But until 2010, only a small minority of workers uh, even raised the issue of democratization or regime change as a strategic uh, objective. And this is one of the reasons why Western observers didn't pay any attention uh, or little attention to this movement. Those who did notice the movement uh, typically asked, when it would transition from bread and butter to political demands. And this question, I would argue, fundamentally misunderstands the movement's import. Because in an autocracy like Hosni Mubarak's Egypt, the capacity to organize large numbers of people to do anything is a political challenge to the regime. Think of Amr Khaled and his being expelled from the country because he could get 30,000 people to come and listen to him preach on Friday. Some workers' actions, and this is a minority, so I want to be clear about that, did openly oppose the regime and its neoliberal policies. For example, in September 2007, workers at the Misr Spinning and Weaving Company, or Ghazal al-Mahalla as it's known, struck for the second time in a year. As the largest factory complex in Egypt, with some 24,000 employees, may even be the largest factory in the Middle East, and the first automated spinning and weaving mill in Egypt, Ghazal al-Mahalla has enormous symbolic and practical significance. Major events there resonate nationally. Several strike leaders did frame their uh, struggle as a political contest with the regime. So Said Habib, uh, one of the two guys in this uh, photo, told Voice of America Radio, we are challenging the regime. Uh, Karim al-Bahiri, uh, a worker and a blogger, uploaded video clips featuring workers chanting, we will not be ruled by the World Bank, we will not be ruled by colonialism, uh, and a photo of the woman, that's this, a photo of women, uh, that's this one, uh, in the midst of a crowd of her colleagues holding a placard uh, proclaiming, down with the government, we want a free government. Another high point of the decade was that in December 2007, municipal real estate tax workers conducted an astonishingly successful strike. In, uh, they occupied the street in front of the Ministry of Finance for 10 days, and uh, they achieved their principal demand of parity with their counterparts employed directly by the ministry, which resulted in a 325% wage increase. And based on this success, Kamal Abu Eita, who is uh, pictured here, uh, and the strike committee transformed itself into a committee to organize an independent union. And in December 2008, they held uh, a meeting with representatives from all of Egypt's governments, uh, declared the independent union of real estate tax authority workers, and uh, shockingly, several months later, uh, in March of 2009, the Ministry of Manpower and Migration uh, recognized it. Now these are exceptional cases, high points in the workers' movement, um, and, uh, but it is, it, in general it's important to uh, uh, emphasize that unlike Poland's solidarity union movement, which is the closest thing to this, the Egyptian workers' movement did not develop a national leadership or a national political program and did not establish a working alliance with the oppositional intelligentsia, which was conducting its own largely parallel movement in which uh, democratization was uh, an explicit demand, Kifaya and several other mobilizations. Consequently, when Mubarak departed, workers could not provide political leadership for the nation as solidarity did in Poland. The most important consequence of the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak for workers was the achievement they shared with all Egyptians, the recovery of their human dignity and their voices. 
Many institutions, practices, attitudes, and personnel of the former regime remain in place. At best, it will take years for them to be transformed. But even the lowest paid and most marginalized workers now feel they have the right to challenge existing hierarchies of power and to demand accountability for their government and their supervisors at work. So this is one group of them, and this is the story that gets cut out of the paper. Uh, these women went on strike for two months, an amazing uh, length of time given the uh, pressures put on them. And you can see in the picture on the left hand side that there are women with their hijabs and one of them uh, even with a niqab standing shoulder to shoulder with men. There was another even bolder picture of that sort on the front page of Al Masri Al Yom uh, during the strike. Um, these women um, were, were the leaders of the strike. They were uh, along with one guy, the spokespersons of the strike. The most important gain of workers as a class since the ouster of Hosni Mubarak is the establishment of national organizations and leaderships that can represent them and articulate their demands as urgent national interests. This is, of course, a complex, unfinished, and contested process. There are competing understandings of workers' interests and rivalries among political tendencies and individuals seeking leadership. Despite the emergence of many high visibility women, they remain severely underrepresented in leading positions in the labor movement. Nonetheless, throughout Egypt and in every uh, economic sector, existing enterprise level union committees have become stronger. Many new unions have also been established. Most concretely, a substantially higher minimum wage has been enacted. Of course, actual practice uh, as anything related uh, to the Egyptian state is rather different than the law. Moreover, militant workers' mobilization continues at an unprecedented level, not only around economic issues, but also against corrupt managements installed in the Mubarak era, and increasingly towards the end of 2011, uh, protests against the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the SCAF. There were two NGOs that worked on labor issues in the 2000s, one the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services and the much smaller Coordinating Committee for Trade Union and Workers Rights and Liberties. Um, neither of them had the capacity to lead the workers movement on a national scale, although the regime uh, believed that the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services was doing that and shut it down for that reason in 2007. Uh, they couldn't even have initiated a strike in any given workplace. They had, between the two of them, uh, fewer than half a dozen uh, paid staff. Uh, in 2009, the Coordinating Committee for Trade Union Workers' Rights and Liberties morphed into the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights, which is directed by labor lawyer Khaled Ali. Um, his high visibility in Cairo and his tireless work made Khaled Ali a key personality in linking workers' economic demands to demands for regime change and democracy. So I'm going to focus on him for a little while, but this is not because I believe that personalities are the key to anything. In late 2009, Khaled Ali represented Nagi Rashad, a worker at the South Cairo grain mill, in a suit resulting in a court order that the government establish an undefined fair minimum wage. The National Council of Wages quickly proposed raising the monthly minimum wage, which was then effectively about 110 pounds a month to uh, 400 Egyptian pounds a month. Although far from adequate, this would have been a substantial increase if the government compelled employers to pay it, but it did not. Again, the gap between the law and the reality. On May 1st, 2010, hundreds of workers and their supporters gathered in front of parliament demanding that the government implement the court order and set a min minimum basic monthly wage of 1,200 Egyptian pounds, which is an amount that was first proposed by the Ghazal al-Mahalla workers in early 2008. They chanted, a fair minimum wage or let this government go home and down with Mubarak and all those who raise prices. Khaled Ali, who is in the middle of the uh, or actually middle left there, just a slightly bald, uh, told the press, the government represents the marriage between authority and money, and this marriage needs to be broken up. We call for the resignation of Ahmed Nazif's government because it works only for businessmen and ignores social justice. So this is the point, I would argue, when the leaderships, the several local leaderships, not all the local leaderships, came together around uh, a demand for regime change, which they were still, for the next half year, pretty inconsistent about, but it was 
the discourse changed. Uh, so it seems obvious then, I would argue, based on the social movement theory argument, as Khaled Hamisi, the author of the best-selling novel Taxi said, that there is continuity between those strikes of the previous decade and the 2011 revolution. Khaled Ali put the matter very precisely. The workers did not start the January 25th movement because they have no organizing structure. But one of the most important steps of this revolution was taken when they began to protest, giving the revolution an economic and social slant besides the political demands. The January 25th uprising provided an opportunity for trade union activists of the previous decade to begin to organize across the boundaries of individual workplaces, which was never very successful before. With support from the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services and the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights, they formed the Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions, a FITU. The existence of the new federation was announced in Tahrir Square on January 30th. Its core comprised the independent unions established since 2008, real estate tax authority workers, medical technicians, teachers, and retirees. Some unions previously affiliated with ETUF, such as the Cairo Public Transport Authority, quickly joined uh, IFITU. Since establishing a trade union outside the framework of ETUF was illegal, Publicly proclaiming the establishment of Ifitu was a revolutionary act, one in which a crime becomes the basis of a new legality. On February 8th, Ifitu called for a general strike in opposition to the regime. There's the banner there. Workers at the Cairo Public Transport Authority, the Suez Canal region, Ghazla al-Mahalla, and other textile workers were among the tens of thousands who answered the call. In February 2011, there were 489 strikes, sit-ins, demonstrations, and other workers' protests. In the three days before Mubarak's departure, there were very likely uh, 60 strikes involving um, hundreds of thousands of workers. Uh, this was very likely a factor in the decision of the SCAF to uh, push Mubarak aside, a semi-coup, semi-revolution, uh, which has universally been called a revolution. The rapid success of the new organization uh, was astonishing. Uh, many new unions were organized, although there's a problem with them in that uh, there's no mechanism to uh, compel uh, workers in a particular workplace once a union has been organized there to pay dues. So there could be a workplace with 2,000 people and 50 people have uh, joined the union, which is what you need now, and uh, the rest of the people don't pay dues. Workers were very quickly uh, keen to assert the social dimension, as uh, Khaled Ali said, uh, of the revolution. So on February 19th, uh, days after Mubarak's ouster, several of the Ifitu leaders uh, met and adopted a statement entitled Demands of the Workers in the Revolution, in which they declared, if this revolution does not lead to the fair distribution of wealth, it is not worth anything. Freedoms are not complete without social freedoms. The right to vote is naturally, naturally dependent on the right to a loaf of bread. A more formal uh, conference of hundreds of Ifitu and would-be Ifitu members convened on March 2nd under the slogan, What Workers Want from the Revolution. One of its key demands was that the army remove the man it had appointed as, as Minister of Manpower and Migration, Ituf Treasurer Ismail Ibrahim Fatri. Those assembled called for him to be replaced by Ahmed Hassan al burai a professor of labor history, uh, labor law, excuse me, at Cairo University, who had for several years advocated trade union pluralism. Within two weeks, al burai was appointed minister. He promptly announced that the ministry would draft a new trade union law based on recommendations of the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services and the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights. This was another key demand of the trade union, uh, the independent trade union movement. al burai also declared that uh, Egypt's treaty obligations uh, endorsing conventions of the International Labor Organization superseded its national law, Law 76, uh, uh, Law 35 of 1976, which made ETUF the sole legal trade union organization uh, in the country. So there is the minister uh, in a panel being chaired by uh, Mustafa Basuni, an open member of a Trotskyist organization, the Revolutionary Socialists, and uh, 
the president of Ifitu eventually, at that point just the real estate tax authority workers, Kamal Abu Eita, and the director of the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services, Kamal Abbas. This is, this is the revolution. This would never have happened in the Mubarak era, that, that a minister has to sit with these guys and discuss uh, what's the workers' role uh, in the revolution. In August uh, 2011, the Ministry of Manpower and Migration nullified the exceptionally fraudulent 2006 national ETOF elections. The ETOF executive board and the boards of 12 of its 23 constituent unions were dissolved. This did not satisfy the demands of independent trade unionists to dissolve ETOF altogether, but it cleared away a large space for them to operate and gain strength. The interim cabinet established a monthly minimum basic wage of 700 pounds for public employees effective July 1st, a 75% increase over the previous rate. Minister of Finance Samir Radwan promised that it would rise to 1,200 pounds over the next five years, but in light of the gruesome state of the economy and Radwan's resignation before the end of the summer, this seems dubious. In October, a private sector minimum wage was established for the first time ever, the same 700 Egyptian pounds. In mid-2011, Kamal Abu Eita became president of, uh, interim president of uh, Ifitu, and in January 2012, the founding Congress uh, elected him to a full term. A year after Mubarak's demise, Ifitu claimed a membership of 200 unions and 2 million blue and white collar workers and retirees. There was a split in the labor movement, uh, of course, in the summer, and uh, in October, the Egyptian Democratic Labor Congress, led by the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services, uh, held its founding Congress with 149 unions affiliated. By January 2012, it claimed 214 affiliated unions with a membership of over 1 million. The Egyptian Democratic Labor Congress claimed not to be a trade union federation, but it certainly walks and talks like one. The two federations combined claim to have three million members in uh, this is a pretty respectable number compared to the 3.8 million members of ETOF in the Mubarak era, but this is almost surely uh, an exaggeration because ETOF's membership was based on 1,800 unions, an average of 2,000 members per union, and this number, 3 million, would mean 7,500 members per union, and that's just not um, possible. Um, nonetheless, um, uh, Workers' actions have continued throughout 2011 at a totally unprecedented rate. The government claimed that there were some 330 actions a year. These are figures from uh, lefty NGOs and, and other organizations, which may be exaggerated, but even if you cut them in half, um, there's a lot, lot more than ever before. So I'm not going to have time to talk about all the ways that the SCAF uh, tried to undermine this, but they did, as we would expect. And I'm also not going to have time to talk about how the workers did in the parliamentary elections, um, which was very bad, um, not because of the SCAF in particular. Um, and as a result of the low visibility of workers uh, in the current parliament and their uh, lack of capacity to uh, organize any serious political presence. Uh, Khaled Ali announced on February 29th that he is running for president. Uh, he was one day past his 40th birthday, which is the minimum age uh, to run for president. This is a guy from a village in Dakahlia, uh, you know, poor kid who went to Zagazig Law School, comes from nowhere. Um, it's a very attractive story, not a winning story in Egypt usually though. Uh, nonetheless, there, there is some significance to this. Despite their weakness then uh, in the parliament and the lack of a political party that really represents them, workers in independent trade unions are now the best organized force confronting the autocratic tendencies of the SCAF, the continuing power of many of the institutions of the Mubarak regime, and in a different register, since they have been democratically elected, the pro-business outlooks of the Muslim brothers, the Salafis, and many of the liberals. But this is not yet saying much. Independent trade unionists have had only one year of experience organizing on a national level, and they have already split, and I didn't get into all the ugly details of it. The SCAF and even many revolutionaries have persistently argued that workers' demands are narrow sectoral demands, not legitimate national political demands. 
Most importantly, even if workers' demands for social justice are embraced, no one has proposed a viable economic program that would enable them to be realized on a national scale while maintaining sustainable economic growth and development. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say that uh, the discussion, of course, revolving around the role of social media and the impact that it's had vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, revolutions, of course, I'm going to be focusing particularly on Egypt, is uh, an, in an increasingly embattled one. Uh, it's one that dominates much of the, uh, the debate, not just within the academy, but outside of it. And I imagine that both uh, Marwan and myself will address it in, in, uh, in some capacity. Um, I am extremely interested in um, the, not just the construction of the social media, but specifically the manner in which discursive uh, meaning uh, and message building happened on the Kulina Khaled Saeed site. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time without belaboring some of the history uh, to sort of explain the genealogy and how things arrived at, at what they have. Um, I think much has been stated about uh, the social media's instrumental role in the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, as well as the uprisings throughout the Arab world. However, very little research has been done on the discourses of Facebook pages and Twitter feeds that have called, organized, and mobilized and documented the anti-government protests throughout the region. This paper, I hope, is uh, an initial analysis of the discursive characteristics of a select group of Facebook pages. Uh, in this case, of course, Khaled Saeed is the most prominent. Uh, it, I argue that the success of these pages depends largely on the success of their administrators in developing a unitarian, progressive, and counter-hegemonic discourse, uh, along with an unambiguous rhetorical stance that appears you know, interestingly, very apolitical, strictly humanistic, and initially reformist, rather than uh, inherently anti-regime. Uh, the paper, I hope, will examine the salience of democratic, deliberative, and representational practices of these pages to showcase how they represented spaces of governance parallel to those of the state. However, they distinguish themselves by demonstrating a facilitation of collective participation and seemingly egalitarian dialogue where all Khaled Saeed serves as an exemplar for a once, once unique political structure that allows for the identification of identitarian commonalities and unifying discourses. And I'm going to hopefully deconstruct everything that I've just stated. Um, there's much to glean from the example of Khaled Saeed and how it shaped uh, the, these discourses that will help inform um, recent manifestations of similar projects uh, that are very distinct but nevertheless borrow from the competitive uh, representational activism that was witnessed uh, on the Kulina Khaled Said site. Uh, some of those examples may be familiar for those who follow Egypt very closely like the Imsik Fulul uh, campaign which was uh, dedicated to expose former uh, NDP uh, operatives and uh, high-level members of the uh, of the party ahead of the parliamentary elections and some might argue had some degree of success in uh, ensuring their scandalization or sort of their, their outing in, in, uh, in the public eye uh, so, long as there were, so long as there was confluence with the broadcast media that uh, were happy to carry the message through in uh, an increasingly critical uh, environment to uh, authoritarianism. A second example is the Musarin campaign, which is a citizenship, uh, sorry, a citizen journalism uh, initiative to document and distribute uh, human rights violations committed by the security apparatus since the, uh, the toppling of Mubarak. Salas al a human uh, chain mobilization campaign to raise awareness of various uh, issues pertaining to the continuation of the revolution, continuation of the revolution being uh, in quotation marks. And then, last but not least, the Kazaboon campaign, uh, which is one that uh, aims to refute the, the SCAF's uh, claims against protesters and incriminate them for violations by transferring capacities from the online spaces to offline. So rebroadcasting or projecting uh, videos illustrating uh, the, uh, uh, the military's violations in public areas uh, so as to take the message offline. I won't spend too much time concerning myself with what I believe has become a very tired and tiring discussion about whether or not the social media deserves of credit for the revolution. Credit, I think, is the crucial point here. Um, I think it's tired because it, uh, it's, to a large extent, obsessed with the positivist patterning of aggregated big data and its subsequent visualization so as to suggest that there's a lot of commotion online uh, that corresponds with public protestation. To put it simply, I think we know that there's a lot of traffic online. So uh, perhaps we're ready to move beyond that. Um, and I think there's also uh, a, a, an intrinsic problem vis-a-vis uh, -vis the discussion surrounding the role and the impact of the social media, and it revolves around what I believe is um, our 
perhaps the linguistic limitations or maybe even laxity uh, that has produced a, a minuscule amount of research on the discursive constructions themselves and the semiotics of, of online social movements. If one wants to poke holes at the technological deterministic argument, it should, it should be extremely straightforward. Um, at least in the case of Egypt, elite and intelligentsia participation in social media uh, privileges them uh, in a manner that I think is, is extremely obvious, even if one were to look at um, or to observe that the, there's a steady increase in uh, online participation in Egypt, maybe a rise between 25% uh, prior to January 25th and maybe up to 32% participation. So it is a marked increase, but nevertheless uh, by no means come close to uh, a sort of a cross-section of, Egyptian, of Egyptian society. Um, in, in the popular assessments of technological determinism, success is usually informed by the hyperbolic claim that new and social media were instrumental not only in rallying public majorities to demonstrate, but rather to topple Mubarak, which I think is very outcome-based uh, position and one that signifies uh, a deeply uh, disconnected and uninformed uh, um, look at um, or sort of an uninformed opinion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what actually happened online in the social media. So moving away from the outcome-based uh, outcome uh, perspective and rather looking at the process, the real questions that one needs to pose are um, first, is it important for us to be looking at this from a chronological standpoint? Um, I think it is, and there are two reasons for that. One is to come to terms with the genealogical uh, and lineaged connections between the various online campaigns and how they emerge to become what they are. And secondly, what are the strategic transformations and the lessons learned about those specific campaigns? Um, and then most importantly, in my opinion, when, how does one define success vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between social media and, uh, and the protest movements? Um, I'm going to sort of go off on a limb here by, by stating that there is such a thing as, as success, but this success should be limited to three categorical definitions. The first is the ability to galvanize support for a cause through self-perpetuated participation on the social media or in the social media rather than anything else. The second point is the ability to contribute material and energy and time to um, you know, uh, respective uh, social media platform beyond voyeurism and including slacktivism. So being activist but still sort of confining one's activism to clicking a like page, liking a page or you know, uh, saying that you support a cause or something along those lines. And then thirdly, uh, translating that from online spaces to offline action. Those are the three that I think are crucial categories that help us gauge what constitutes success. Beyond that, I think we cannot go uh, far enough to uh, articulate uh, the toppling of the regime and its relationship to social media. Um, okay. So um, I want to say a few things about the youth awakening. Understanding the relationship between the social media and revolt without problematizing youth disenchantment leaves us without compelling evidence to explain dissidents under authoritarianism. Um, I'm going to, I think there are six points uh, of consideration here. The first is the rise of the Kifaya movement in 2005, which re essen essentially broke the public communicative silence by asserting, of all things, silence itself. Movement created discursive breadth but could not translate that to, to the available technology outside of satellite television. So you would, see, you would often see that the Kifayev movement were able to amplify their message through satellite television. Al Jazeera spent a significant amount of time covering uh, uh, the Kifayev movement and by default, um, uh, Georges Hat found himself on television quite frequently uh, in those platforms. But nevertheless, there was a ger generational divide and most of the, pro the progenitors of the Kifayev movement could not actually utilize what was then so, uh, yeah, basic capacities of social media. In fact, even the website of the Cafe movement was extremely minuscule and very small. Of course, there were attempts to go offline, meaning that uh, even the templates of the stickers that were used in this particular photo, the sticker covering the mouth that says Cafe, was actually uh, distributed online in hope that it would eventually make its way into the streets. But nevertheless, uh, very limited capacities. Within this particular milieu uh, emerged you know, the character that we've come to accept as a, you know, at least according to Time magazine, is the most influential young, er uh, young Arab, Wael Ghunem, and others who entered the social media fray during this particular moment. Simultaneously, 
and of course it tends to be ignored and, and dismissed not just in the Western media standpoint but also within uh, the discussions surrounding social media and revolution uh, is the uh, development and the growth of, of spaces for dialogic deliberation on the part of the Islamist camps. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi online platforms while they chose uh, for a significant period of time to avoid wor uh, working with both Twitter and, uh, and Facebook, they nevertheless were able to galvanize and motivate people to participate on a, on a fairly extensive basis. Uh, so there's a tendency to overexpose Facebook and Twitter and uh, there was of course a genuine fear on their part that there might be uh, um, risks of uh, surveillance and perhaps penetrability when using platforms that uh, uh, that are not as, as firewalled. Uh, the third point uh, is that is the appeal of social media for self-representational narcissism and personal narrativization. And this is something that we're accustomed to in, in terms of most discussions of social media, but one cannot divorce that from uh, the manner in which um, Arabs and, and Egyptians for that matter uh, and young people in the region used social media. Uh, most of the uh, most social media uh, social um, uh, media uh, usage was confined to self-representation and you know distributing uh, content that would otherwise be described as as frivolous or apolitical uh, but when do things switch or what, what when does the switch happen um, and then fourthly I think there's a growing disenchantment with the state and private media's incapacitation and inability to present oppositional perspectives in the case of Egypt of course there's been sort of a growing uh, openness as far as some of the independent slash private media but nevertheless uh, the red lines remained red lines and uh, we saw that uh, manifest in some cases such as Ibrahim Isa's arrest and, and uh, brief sentencing uh, for uh, raising the issue of uh, Hosni Mubarak's illness just a few year, a couple of years before the revolution. Um, in addition to that, there's the new, me new media being seen as spaces for critical deliberation and of relative safety uh, from authoritarian regimes reach. Now, of course, this is extremely impractical and unlikely, uh, at least for the first uh, few individuals that decided to utilize the social media for activism uh, because they understood full well that the state security apparatus was capable of surveilling with an incredible amount of efficiency. And since the, uh, the, um, the storming of the state security building, there is clear evidence that uh, a lot of information had been collected and very little had been acted on. Uh, so that, of course, raises uh, questions that uh, I think Joseph Sassoon spoke about in, in the first panel. Uh, you know, what, what do the institutions do with information? Uh, what do they not do with information? And what purpose does it serve? And of, of course, it also raises questions about the possibility of, of a deep state in Egypt and general acceptance of uh, certain levels of, of discursive criticism against the regime. And then the sixth point is, uh, the fact that the, uh, the raising of questions about the politicization of online spaces and the use of social media uh, are sometimes frivolous in and of themselves. And frivolous is a problematic uh, term, uh, so not to be too postmodern about this, um, one has to sort of be able to move forward beyond that. Um, now, the April 6th uh, movement and, and the Facebook strike um, the emergence of the April 6th movement online platform in 2008 and the Mahalla labor stand that Joe, uh, Joe uh, spoke on uh, previously uh, are a significant moment in the narrativization and historicization of the role of social media. Uh, but arguably there's a growing um, sort of revisionist history that's emerging on this, on this point. Uh, a lot of the labor activists that were based uh, in Mahalla at the time the, uh, that had been discussed um, actually say that the April 6th movement were not there. They were not physically there. But rather that they were, uh, they basically were able to translate the content and uh, catapult it on a different platform. So that the, you know, the online campaign was very much disconnected from the offline campaign. So what does this mean as far as the April 6th movement and, you know, its Facebook platform? First, that uh, they did something that is quite peculiar and very counterintuitive, which is basically to go from offline to online. There was activism going on uh, in Mahalla and they were able to sort of migrate it to a different platform. Um, and I'll explain why that might be particularly interesting. And then secondly, their ability to amplify the dissident messages from geostrategic peripheral regions to the centers, to the, Kyr to the, uh, the Kyrene epicenter. Um, and of course, there, you know, the security apparatus was fairly adept at being able to separate uh, and, and disaggregate uh, the geography in the country to the extent that uh, the governorates were, uh, were sort of out of, um, out of 
focus, out of center, and, uh, and completely neglected, for even from a media standpoint. So this is an attempt to sort of circumvent this uh, blockade against uh, non, you know, non Cairo, non, non Alexandria, and the non urban sort of metropolitan regions. And then, thirdly, uh, is the fact that the April 6th movement with this particular Facebook campaign were attempting to reach an increasingly socially conscious uh, upper class uh, youth. And of course, I, I put quotation marks around socially conscious. Perhaps at least uh, one could consider them naively out of touch. Uh, with the plight of the so-called masses. And so there was this um, interest in what might be happening in Mahalla and does it mean anything. Um, you throw in a little bit of nuclear power and you get a very strange concoction. Um, in the absence of a tipping point to catapult the cyber dissidents of the April 6th movement and, compar and a comparatively weak notion of leaderlessness during this period, the April 6th movement and other youth collectives courted Mohammed al baradei which I think is very important to historicize, that they courted Mohammed al baradei to help popularize their movement. The first gauge of success was supposed to be predominantly online. And the first steps towards destigmatizing the anti-regime anti participa participatory action began with the Facebook page of uh, uh, Mohammed al baradei which of course in a, sh a short few months far surpassed the page of, of April 6th and others. So there was a lot of shift in both strategy and in time invested to uh, the Mohammed al baradei page. Uh, the traffic on his Facebook page versus number of uh, members or likes uh, is a clear indication that the public discourse of dissent eventually swayed. But there was a lot of reluctance initially uh, because of the, the sort of the power at least in terms of uh, um, uh, you know, fictionalized power of the state security apparatus and uh, the panopticon uh, role that they might be playing, there was a genuine fear that by simply liking a page that one could be monitored, could be surveilled, could be followed and might have serious repercussions. Uh, retrospectively, one can see Again, this is you know hindsight's 2020, but retrospectively, one can see that El Baradei's failure to perhaps galvanize public support offline, um, while having something to do with the lack, may have something to do with the lack of charisma and other functions of leadership and vision and general appeal. But there's a strong case to be made that El Baradei was predominantly an online phenomenon. That the first sign there was the disparity between the online. It may be the first sign of a disparity between the online and offline spaces, which has become now an endemic part of the. Egyptian social uh, media sphere. Um, so some of the people who were working on the Al Baradei page had also worked on the April 6th page and then eventually, uh, at least in the case of Wa'il Ghunem, uh, decided that the success uh, of Al Baradei's page was limited uh, to what is clearly an anti-regime discourse that has extremely limited appeal publicly and may not uh, actually draw in the regime-invested elite. Um, enter Khaled Saeed's death. Um, with his death, and of course what followed, I'm, I'm going to show the image very briefly and then move away from it, but uh, uh, for those of you who may not have seen this before, the reason why the Khaled Saeed movement became what it was is the, is the image taken from the morgue of uh, Khaled uh, after having been beaten by the police. So this is what the image looks like. Okay, I'm going to switch away from it. Um, and anyway, we now know, of course, that uh, this particular image was actually uh, distributed widely by Ayman Noor, who is himself a former presidential candidate and is someone who may possibly be running in the future election. Wael Ghunayn migrates his efforts to reach the online elite based on what he believed would be the potential uh, appeal of this, this particular image and the manner in which uh, it, uh, it evokes uh, both disgust at, at the regime and, uh, and uh, may actually galvanize people to support uh, critical action. Uh, by creating a space for, for disinhibited critique of regime without actually demanding regime change became the impetus for this movement. So amplification, of course, this had to be amplified using broadcasting. So eventually when the photograph of Khaled Saeed who had been beaten, the image I just showed, uh, was broadcast on Dream 2, uh, on, the, of course, one of the most prominent talk shows uh, in, on Egyptian private television. It raises the question of why this happened, who gave the green light for something like this to broadcast. And, uh, of course, you know, not, not to be a cynical about this, but it, uh, it raises the question of perhaps collaborative connections between specific media organizations and some manifestation of, again, the deep state uh, that preserves the status quo despite allowing for a safety valve for criticism. Nevertheless, in the process, the social media became an in a particularly interesting space. We're all Khaled Saeed, uh, in a matter of days, was able to acquire tens of thousands of, of followers. The administrator's discourse is part and parcel of the success of the page, uh, the fact that it was agreeable, calm, conciliatory, polite, compassionate, um, 
inclusive and dynamic. It was focused on positive messages, the avoidance of all profanities and vulgarity, which was extremely easy to do given the, uh, the blatancy of the regime's uh, both uh, brutality, at least in this particular uh, evocative and, and, uh, and straightforward example. Um, it was also completely depoliticized and avoided religious exp expression so as to avoid deterring secular and liberal elite, which of course constituted the majority of people using those specific platforms. It also did something extremely interesting, which, it, which is I think where the discussion surrounding uh, participatory uh, governance comes in. Uh, the administrator used a significant amount of surveys and polls and opinions gathered. I mean to give people the impression that they were part and parcel of the development of the messages of the page as well as its actual uh, mobilizational strategies. Um, now, um, overcoming the police state's monopoly on the streets and securitization of public space became the largest problem um, and overcoming slacktivism. So there are various strategies. Uh, the first was the quote unquote silent revolution, how to take online activism and translate it into offline spaces. Um, first is, you know, you have to avoid what is described by the police as the kamesha, which is basically like a clamp. You clamp a uh, small protest so as to confine it and prevent anybody from accessing it. And of course, it, you can dissolve it in a very short time period. In this case, the silent protests were long lines of people on the waterfront or on the, uh, on the beachfront, uh, facing the water, in, not interacting, totally silent, dressed in black, occupying a large amount of space so that they cannot be contained. It was able to, uh, they could do so with expediency, with unpredictability, uh, they, could they could do so without violating the emergency laws uh, conditions on congregation uh, and the police would be neutralized. And then most importantly, for those individuals who were incapable of coming out and, and protesting or joining this quote unquote silent revolution, which happens to be the majority, even those who are you know, basic voyeurs, could participate in some fashion, which is to, if you have an apartment or a balcony that faces these protests, you take photos of them and post them online and circulate them. So it becomes a self-perpetuating system for galvanization. Um, the participatory action also involved ways, again, to go offline. And the, f the image I show above is of an Egyptian 100-pound banknote that, had, that reads, no to, uh, no to torture, no to the emergency law, this country is our country. And there was a campaign to write this on a million banknotes to distribute them so that everybody understood in a sort of V for Vendetta way that we're all part of the same sort of network. The poll underneath it is a poll taken of individual, of everybody on the page. Uh, of course, the participation here is about 3,000, so a fairly small, of course, this is pre-revolution. Uh, pre uh, and of course, it, it, it actually asks people, how many, how many family members do you have are members of the police force? And can, are you prepared to, or are you comfortable enough reaching out to them and telling them to give you do a documented material that illustrates torture inside jail? So an attempt to sort of capitalize on uh, at least, you know, each person has is at least one degree of separation from a member of the police force so as to further incriminate. But the key is to concentrate on police brutality versus anything else. And I know that I'm quickly running out of time. Uh, one minute, okay, all right. So, um, of course, uh, protest movement unfolds, uh, January 25th, January 28th, um, <laughs> the day of rage, and we're at social media from interlocutor to champion. So Western media goes absolutely berserk, and uh, of course you start seeing these cartoons. Social media led everything, and we, uh, of course, um, it overcoming the of course, the, social, the Western media has to overcome the complete incomprehensibility of an action in a place where there's no history of it, apparently. Of course, there's nobody paying attention to the work that, <laughs> that Joel is, is documenting. And of course, there's the, the complete absence <laughs> The complete absence of translatability, you know, the swift, inf the swift informancy and detectability. Now, where are we now? So, we have nightmares for Clay Shirky, the internet gets shut off and participation skyrockets. Uh, we also have, uh, of course, the total disparity between the Facebook quote unquote generation and the majority of, the, of uh, Egyptian society. Um, and, of course, why are we not all Khalid Said? First of all, as soon as the page reaches 800,000 followers uh, in less than a few months, uh, unexpected things happen. The end of anonymity, while well, Ghanim is now a public figure, everybody knows who he is, everybody knows how the page unfolds, and of course it's a memoir and it's generating a lot of money. Uh, it's also an, a crisis of harmonization. How do you couple political representation in its current form with new players and, and old players uh, playing a significant role and having their own platforms for communication with a street that is, uh, that is very much uh, uh, on, on sort of steady grounds continuing the protest. Uh, most of protests have actually migrated to uh, the, the offline spaces anyway. 
so how does one come to terms with that? And then the, lastly, the best example of this absolute catastrophe for the social media is the March 19th constitutional referendum, where the, if you were to follow the social media, at least 75% of people online who voted in various polls said that they were voting against it. And it was an extremely powerful campaign online, but did not translate offline. Uh, instead, you've got this banner from the Muslim Brotherhood that says, you know, this is how things are done. Uh, the outcome, 77% for the referendum and 22.8% uh, against it. I'm not going to include any of this. But basically, where does this take um, the social media in the next period. Uh, the social media, as far as the Kulina Khalid Said page, has lost both the tweets and the streets. It's a precarious and uncommitted relationship to the protest movement and the failure to follow through on the Revolution Continues camp. Cyber activists have now moved to uh, moved out of the echo chambers, out of these environments where uh, it's, uh, it's groupthink and self-interest, and participatory governance is now transforming into uh, institutional complementarity. So this is what, we, what Egyptian social media environment looks like. If you're want, looking at Kulina Khaled Said's page in the last few days, on the right-hand side, you've got the ultras who are calling for the continuation of the revolution because they lost members of Al-Ahli uh, uh, supporters. And on the left-hand side, you've got the page actually uh, collecting questions uh, to ask the Speaker of the Parliament, Al-Katatni, uh, in, uh, in a future interview and trying to couple the two sides of a democratic process that is effectively bifurcating Egyptian society and leaving little room for communication between the online spaces and the offline spaces. Thank you. So I usually don't do PowerPoint and, and don't read, but between this being after lunch, me being jet lagged, and Ted's vigilant eye on the 20 minutes, I'm going to read a little bit, show you a few things, and, and, and talk uh, on the rest. So um, I'm going to start where Adel ended, pretty much. Uh, we have, this is, a, this is a, a syndrome of wise people thinking alike. Um, in book seven of The Republic, Plato stages a dialogue, a, a fictional dialogue, um, of his famous allegory of the cave as a, you know, exchange between his teacher, Glaucon, and his brother, I'm sorry, between Socrates and, and Glaucon, Plato's brother, to, in his, in his words, illustrate, quote, our nature and its education and want of education. So in the allegory, most of you are probably familiar with it. Um, you have a number of people living chained um, in front of a wall with a fire burning behind them. And the closest they get to reality is through the shadows of people passing behind them. So the shadows are projected because of the fire on the wall. And the dialogue proceed like this. And if they were able to converse with one another, what would, they not, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? Very true. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side. Would they not be sure to fancy when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice which they heard came from the passing shadow? No question. To them, I said, this is Socrates speaking. The truth would be literally nothing more but the shadows of the images on the wall. Now, I like to use this metaphor to talk about the battles of representation that are raging um, in, in um, the uprisings. The prisoners begin ascribing truth and reality and meaning to the forms and shadows they see on the wall. The philosopher, in Plato's view, is the person you know, the intellectual king um, um, who is able to exit the cave and distinguish between reality and the shadows on the wall. Like Plato's cave, the battles of representation unfolding in the uprisings are haunted by shadows. Blogs and social media are in many ways a large echo chamber, shared at once by the foot soldiers of the uprisings, by cyber dissidents, by Arab and foreign intelligence agencies, and a motley crew of loose cannons and crackpots. Mainstream news sources the Al Jazeera's and the CNN's and the BBC's reporting from many countries have often resorted to playing videos they've gleaned on YouTube with commentary by people whose legitimacy, some mysterious commentator who claims to be in Hama or who claims to be um, in Benghazi, often identified by their first name, describe over the phone what is going on here. In that version 2.0 of Plato's Cave, words, sounds, and images circulate faceless, sourceless, without an address. There have been many contrived events, fake witnesses, phony victims, uncorroborated rumors to which the mainstream media have contributed greatly. A call to demonstrate, for example, may have been posted by genuine activists or by intelligence agents posing as friends, 
often after incarcerating the actual Facebook friend and torturing their Facebook password out of their mouth. The social medium hailed as a technology of freedom is also a dictator's dream database available with a few keystrokes. Now, I want to tell you a couple of, of stories. Um, one of the advantages of being in Beirut is that kind of data about what's going on comes to you. So there are many um, Syrian dissidents who escape Syria and come to Beirut. And I was talking to one of them not too long ago, and he told me about a phenomenon that basically when you get caught, uh, one of the first things that your interrogator wants to know is your, fa your Facebook password. So you, you're roughed up a little bit, and then you're asked to give up the password. So much so that some of the kids who were not on Facebook created Facebook accounts, so they had something to give away under torture, so they don't get tortured. Okay, so this is, this is, this is one of the assumptions that are made about the power of social media, which is really a game of, of shadows and images. Even people who are not active on Facebook have recently, at least, felt the need to acquire these accounts because, if, because they believe that their interrogator would not believe them if they claimed they were not on Facebook. So just, just an anecdote to file away. So in this context, therefore, um, it's, it's very important to try to step out of, of what I'm calling um, Plato's digital cave. Um, since the beginning of the uprisings in Tunisia, uh, many analysts have rushed to understand these events as media-driven. Now, um, I have colleagues who have told me that as, as somebody who's, who teaches media and who studies media and communication, this is like committing um, um, professional suicide by being so skeptical about the role of the media. But this is where what I'm seeing is leading me to. There's um, a rush to media centrism, a form of technological determinism that really warps how we view social and political events as a privileged optic. Now, um, I'm going to focus today on... Um, this public discourse in the United States, I'm not trying to single out American public discourse, Arab public discourse, you know, the, the, the French press, for instance, has been um, equally guilty, Arab media have been equally guilty of hyping um, social media. But I will focus today on, on the U.S. because this is where we are, and I think this is where the discussion afterwards could be most productive. So I, I will first discuss the media hype. I will focus, um, I will revisit some moments in history to see is it true that what's going on today is unprecedented? To what extent are we seeing new things? But most importantly, I'm very interested in articulating two things. The history of how we understand the role of media in political change, which has a very long history, um, especially in um, um, academic knowledge production in the United States, with the history of actual media uses for social change. So if we look at the media hype, um, right after Tunisia started, it's absolutely staggering. And um, the more I look at it, the more I feel, and I ask myself, am I exaggerating? Am I overreacting? And no, the, the, more, the more I find, the more I feel that it was truly, truly uh, blown completely out of proportion. Um, we all remember um, some anchors on cable TV here in the US choking with giddiness, reporting that a couple in Egypt has named their daughter Facebook. Um, this, is, this is a story that gained so much. I have a grad student now analyzing these stories. The amount of visibility they got compared to what was going on on the ground, compared to people getting killed, compared to you know, camels and, 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 um, and all those things um, attacking people is, is, is really staggering. There were very um, important voices of dissent. Um, Malcolm Gladwell became known for something he wrote before um, the uprising in October 2010 arguing that social media had nothing to do with revolution, but deep social ties are what, what make people actually become willing to face bullets and to face potential death. Um, Frank Rich in the, in the New York Times wrote some very provocative pieces. I'll share some, um, um, some of them with you. So I'm not saying that there was a monolithic discourse. It was just a very dominant framework of looking at things. Um, there are many reasons behind this hype. One of them is that the spread of online media um, since 2000, roughly speaking, um, in the Arab world, or, or, and most importantly since 2005, like um, the, the satellite um, 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 explosion of the 90s is an important phenomenon. But I think there's something more here, which is that many of these conflicts were extremely difficult for journalists to cover. So there were not people or fewer people or no people on the ground covering events at a very local level. There was also the lack of Arabic language skills with which you really cannot understand, uh, without which you really cannot understand what's going on. And the fact that a significant number of Arab bloggers blog in English. And, and you have the perfect storm for people to imagine that somehow social media is the, um, is a mirror of what's going on as opposed to is, is, a, is, a, is an, a bunch of instruments of representation that are not necessarily authentic or reliable or all, all that stuff. So where does this lead us? Um, one more thing I, that I want to mention very quickly is that the hype of social media in American mainstream media 
has a lot to do with the difficult situation that television, but especially U.S. newspapers, are going through. U.S. newspapers are in decline. Um, a lot of newspapers are under threat of, of shutting down because of online media, and they're very threatened by, by online media. They don't know exactly what to do with them. They're trying to find ways to monetize them, to create a revenue stream. And so that, that also needs to be mentioned as one of the reasons why um, social media is this big, kind of scary um, um, thing for the mainstream media. But there's something much more important, which is um, this myth of emancipatory media. What um, Ethel um, de Sola Poole, who was at MIT um, until 15 or 20 years ago, he wrote a book called Technologies of Freedom. Basically the notion that technologies nearly always help human beings achieve greater agency and global, um, greater freedom in, in their lives. So I wanna, I wanna quote to you, um, I'm not interested in personalizing this, so I'm not going to mention the name of the person. Let me just say that this is the president of a major scholarly association, many of us belong to it, um, who wrote in a, in a, in a newsletter about, um, about the uprisings the following. Middle East youth are using new technologies, the social media, to animate their actions, regardless of their level of education. So social class and educational um, attainment seem to, to have been um, thrown out of the window. In 2005, um, the, the newsletter continues. Facebook, YouTube, and other social media kept the protesters of the world tied to the compelling events on the streets of Beirut. In 2005, Facebook and YouTube in the streets of Beirut and triggered sympathetic demonstrations. Now, let's look at the facts. Um, in fact, it's only on October 1st, 2005, so about more than half a year after the demonstrations in Beirut, that Facebook expanded from very few universities in the United States to some European universities. Facebook did not become available um, in Lebanon until two or three years later, at the very earliest. That's one. The domain name YouTube was actually created on February 14, 2005. So, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen anything linking the creation of YouTube to the assassination of Hariri, but I'm sure if you look hard enough, you'll find that. Um, so, so the bottom line, if, if you, for YouTube and Facebook to have been used in the demonstrations in Beirut, the demonstrators had to have been capable of space travel, of time travel. Um, and the, this is, these are arguments that return with alarming frequency, uh, with a level of certainty that, that really, for, for, you know, for, for people who have written books and articles, it's, it's truly everybody has been taken by, by the hype. Now, by March 2011, as graffiti scribbled by um, kids on the walls of Dar'a was igniting the Syrian uprisings, um, I was getting a steady stream of journal articles of books. There were books by March. There were books about the uprisings. Three months into the events, there were books about them, um, shopping for a publisher. And um, th they were saying ast astounding things. They would do surveys, a um, couple of examples. Um, survey on Tahrir Square in February, um, um, interviewed a thousand people. Seventy percent of them said the most important factor that led them to go to the street was having a conversation about it with someone they know. And about less than 30% mentioned online media. And yet in the conclusion of the same manuscript, the author said Facebook was the most important reason why people went to the street. In the same, this is eight pages later. And it kept coming on and on and on and on, as if hype was as permeable to light as the thick walls of Plato's cave. Now, so if we want to look at at, this, at the history of, of, um, of, use of, of the use of media in, in, in social dissent. And the argument that the uprisings were unprecedented or unique. Uh, Piers Morgan on CNN said, the use of social media was, quote, the most fascinating and most important aspect of this whole thing. And this captures really uh, um, the discourse. So if we look at history, we know that um, demonstrators have used Many times, activists have used over and over again the new media of the day um, to press for political change. We know this from the Protestant Reformation. Uh, we know this from Iran, from the Iranian Revolution. These have been documented by many scholars, the, uh, the accounts and, and, and interpretations that have survived um, um, time. Um, we don't have to look further than the Egyptian Revolution of 1919. And I think this, is, this provides perhaps the best example, the best counter-argument that what happened in 2000 and, and, and um, um, at, and 11 uh, was neither unprecedented nor unique. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things in, in 1919 was um, the suspension by the British of street theater activities. They banned street theater activities for a couple of months because they felt this was the most subversive medium by which the nationalists were fighting them. 
And if you look at the way it actually happened, very brutal, very much like Mubarak saying, we're cutting the cable, you know, we're, we're, we're unplugging um, the servers, we're cutting off the internet. There was a, a woman who was killed, whose pictures was used by um, the nationalists. Um, I'm not gonna go in, into the details because I need to move on to something else. Very much like a kind of a paper era um, Khaled Saeed. There were um, 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 all kinds of pamphlets that were distributed, some of them called for revolutionary action, some of them ridicule, ridiculed um, the powers that be, um, others gave practical information on how to avoid um, the, you know, the, the, the British and their collaborators, very much what we saw on Facebook. Now, some people um, may argue that, and, and people have argued this with me when, I, when I've raised this point, is that yes, you know, these were not um, unprecedented, but the speed with which you can access information is unprecedented. And so this is something I, you know, let, I said, okay, let's, let's revisit this. So I looked at the Lutheran um, 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 Reformation, and there were very credible accounts that less than two weeks after Luther had um, nailed his theses on, on the wall, um, the entire, what, what one observer at the time, the entire realm of Christendom was aware of all of them. A couple of weeks, yeah, it's not immediate, but a couple of weeks is still um, um, quite fast. Now, these were in Latin. Very few people could um, um, use Latin back then. There were pamphlets that were written in the Germanic vernacular. Um, one of them, for instance, the Sermon on, on, on Indulgences and Grace, was reprinted 14 times. That's only in 1518. And each time more than 1,000 copies. And, and if, you, if you map out the spread of this, it really is not much slower than the human capacity to read, understand, and act upon what they're reading, which is something that is not discussed at all in accounts of social media. So of all the Facebook pages out there about Egypt, let's say, and of all the activists, you really need the perfect storm of the right person reading the right page with the right information and acting upon it for, this, for, for it to create, um, for, for us to be able to make arguments about any kind of causal mechanisms. And yet, these arguments are made um, quite um, easily um, based on, on, you know, w w without being able to connect online inf information online or pictures online with actual people reading, digesting, distributing the information, acting upon it. A couple more um, um, anecdotes here. One of the things about, about the, um, the 1919 Egyptian Revolution is uh, that illustrates the speed with which the nationalists would react to, to events. If you look at the, um, the American delegation at the U.S. Paris, at, at, the, at, the, at the Paris Peace Conference. So Woodrow Wilson comes out one day and says, um, the American delegation supports British control over Egypt. And we have, thank you, that's all I need. We have some, some excellent accounts about, um, within a couple of hours, there were pamphlets denouncing the American um, um, decision. Remember, te the telegraph existed. The telegraph is nearly as fast as the internet, in terms of, if you, if you factor in the human capacity to, to, to to digest information. So this is um, a couple of examples. The last example I want to use to compare the two is the notion that in 1919 and 2011, it was not an individual media platform that made any difference, but it was rather an integrated system of communication, whereby a word can, can fly across various media platforms, um, and then you know a, a mobile phone, um, somebody captures a pic on a mobile phone, um, SMSs it, texts it away to someone who posts it on a blog, some mainstream journalist sees it, puts it on, um, on, on, on a newscast or a talk show, a newspaper carries it. We've seen this over and over again, and it's not about one medium um, um, dominating um, anything. Now, the last thing I want to mention here is um, looking at historical framework with which political change has been understood, and I have about 20 pages in here which I will spare you about um, um, Daniel Lerner's modernization theory and how it's really, this is, this is really the dominant framework to understand what sup supposedly media did in, uh, in the uprising. Goes back to Lerner, his theory based on empathy. Um, basically, the way I interpret the relationship between Mubarak and, and Runeim is the relationship um, between um, um, Lerner's grocer and the village chief. Uh, one is a traditionalist, one is a transitionalist. You know, you have, you have this, this, this guy who blogs in English and Arabic, who obviously is, has a lot of empathy, as we know from the tears he shed on TV. Uh, there, 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 are, there are so many resonances between, between the framework, the, the initial story published first in 1955, and the story in 2011 that I think they cannot be ignored. 
Now, I want to conclude with, with two ideas. Um, one of them is to look at the media as not instruments of contestation, but themselves a field of, of contestation. This is a, a graffiti that I, um, I took this picture in Cairo in November. And so since then, I've been collecting graffiti about the media in the context of the revolution. And one of the things I want to go back to to, um, um, to kind of put this in a framework is to go back to a, to a book by um, um, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, the queer theorist. Um, the, the book is Epistemology of the Closet, which I found, amazingly enough, one of the most um, helpful books for me to understand what's going on in the, in the um, um, uprisings. She argues that binary oppositions in the realm of sexuality inhibit both kind of human agency and freedom, and on the other hand, in inhibits human understanding of human um, agency and freedom. And so one of the things that I, I would propose is the, the way to understand the role of, of the media in the Arab uprisings is to create what I would like to call an epistemology of the cave. Um, the, such an epistemology, such an approach would treat every single utterance, um, every single speech act, communication utterance, as a strategic deployment of public discourse rather than a truthful representation of events. Such an approach would jettison oppositions between social and mainstream media, between regime propaganda and opposition propaganda, between Mecca and mechanization. You know, Lerner would say it's either Mecca or mechanization, and we have plenty of examples um, of people embracing both. Um, so through a full elaboration of this framework is not, is not at hand. This is just a, a very preliminary idea. I would like to focus on a couple of things. So the first thing is the media as battleground. Now, um, I showed you this, um, this graffito. Um, there are others. Let me show you a couple more, right? The, 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 the kind of glorification of some journalists and uh, because of the stand they took. Um, is, this is also from Cairo. Uh, this is from Beirut. This is, um, this is Uncle Thum being kind of um, rendered speechless by Haifa Wehbe. This is, I'll, I'll explain this later in, in, in the discussion. This, this needed about five minutes. Um, I am here, again, the, you know, this is um, Intaj. This is different from the Intaj campaign in Egypt. Uh, this is a Beirut campaign about um, basically every image you see from the uprising is a production rather than a faithful representation of reality. This is um, right next to where I'm living right now. The revolution will be graffitied, not televised. And, and so one of, the, one of the interesting things is that it, I, I see these as symptoms of, of a, of a self-reflexive discourse or, or of, a, of a reflexive discourse about the role of media, that media weave stories. They don't represent reality. And I think that's a very important point that, that, that we don't talk enough about. The other point that I will conclude with is the notion of that, that ascribing excessive power to social media, um, among many things, obliterates human agency and reduces the richness of communication to the exchange of digital information. So one of the things I would like to propose is to expand our understanding of media and include the human body as media. I think this is something that I feel very strongly about. In fact, this is, this is the beginning of a project in which I'm trying to rewrite um, the media and the Arab uprising from the perspective of a human body. What if we looked at what's going on from the perspective of the human body as the dominant medium of expression? What if we looked at the young man and humps who took off their shirts and said, look, this is my naked body, shoot me. I'm not dissimulating any weapon. That's an act of communication primarily. What if we looked at um, um, Muhammad Bouazizi, who's credited rightly or wrongly with, with starting um, 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 the whole thing? Uh, what if we looked at the abused body of, of, of Khalid Saeed, galvanized anger against the regime, the fictitious body of Amin al-Abdullah, the gay uh, uh, girl in Damascus blogger, who didn't exist, the mutilated body of Zainab al-Husni, this young woman uh, from Homs who supposedly was captured by, by regime goons and, and mutil mutilated, raped, um, cut in pieces, who reappeared a few days later on TV. We still don't know her real story. And if you look at the media narratives about her, it depends who you support, basically. Uh, what if we looked at the exposed body of Alia al-Mahdi, the so-called nude blogger? What if we look at, at the anonymous woman who has become known as Blue Bra Girl? Imagine such a moniker sticking. It's because we don't know who she is and what exactly happened. What if we look at the bodies of journalists who literally died to tell the story? Um, my neighbor in Beirut was Anthony Shadid, who died a couple of weeks ago. And one of the interesting things about, about Anthony is, uh, who was writing for the New York Times, as, as many of you know, he would go um, into Syria very often 
And this is one of the very few persons writing in English who actually had access to very local events in Syria. And we would talk on a frequent basis, so Anthony, what's going on? And he'll say, Marwan, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. The, the, when he died, he was trying to collect information that he felt would, would really allow him to say, this is um, uh, what exactly is going on. So if we, um, if we were to include the human body in our definition of media, I think, um, we would perhaps kind of get away from the strap of identifying a small part of a part of what's going on, because that's what the media that we are familiar with give us access to, and mistaking it um, uh, for the whole. I think time, um, we need to wait before, books don't need to be published three months after they start, the thing started, they don't need to be published this year. Um, time will give us some, some help, it exposes shadows as shadows, it gives us a better sense of the trajectory of events, it allows us to read about the history and politics um, of the Arab world, you know, the Egyptian labor movement, the textile worker union, the Sudanese Communist Party, Palestinian human rights activists, Tunisia's feminist activists, Bahrain's long-standing um, civil disobedience movement. You know, if, if um, a, a networked bunch of activists with a lot of gadgets in their hands is all what it took to take down a regime, the Bahraini royal family would have been in retirement for a very long time. Bahrain is very networked. It has a tradition of civil dis disobedience that goes back to independence uh, um, uh, from the British. And so I think we really need to stop, take a breath, um, and wait to understand what exactly is going on. Thank you. We have time for questions. Uh, we would ask that you not tweet the questions, but approach the uh, microphones up front and identify yourself. Unless you guys would like. <laughs> Could you speak? Hello, my name is Ibrahim Hussein. I'm an Egyptian American living here in Washington, D.C. And this is a question to the whole panel. All morning and all through the discussion, I was looking for one word that I'm from Egypt uh, that describe what's happening in Egypt. The, the word is collaboration. And this is really a sad situation in politics, in journalism, in the labor union. You, you, you don't see a way that people pull together and collaborate. As a matter of fact, there is no Arabic word for collaboration. I'm asking if anybody knows it. How could you, would you comment on this? Could they collaborate? If they want to ever succeed in a revolution or a change, they must collaborate in all areas. So we'll take one more question and then go ahead. Hi, um, Vivian Salama, I'm a journalist. Uh, worked in the Middle East the last eight years. Um, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on what happened that morning of uh, January 28th when the phones went out and the internet went out. I mean, we know what happened, but how did the protests succeed? I mean, I've covered protests in Egypt for years, and in those cases, I mean, any, any obstacles would have probably caused the protests to fizzle out. I mean, was it a Tunisia effect, do you think, that kind of drove people to continue on to Tahrir? despite the fact that they had no communication. I'd really love your thoughts on it, because we as journalists were shocked when everybody ended up converging at that point, you know, right before um, the bridge. And so I'd love to hear what you think. So I, I can tell you what people told me, because I wasn't there on that day. The activists decided that instead of calling people to gather in Tahrir, that they would call them to gather in small squares in neighborhoods. And then they called people out of the street, out of their houses, to come with them, and they were joined by lots of people. And so why, by the time they got to medium-sized squares where there were security forces, there were too many people, and they overwhelmed the security forces. And then there was, of course, the big, uh, battle on the bridge, and again, there were more people than the security forces were uh, prepared to uh, contain, uh, so they succeeded. Um, and there were also um, printed leaflets given out beforehand. So um, 
on the one hand, very old media, and on the other hand, something which uh, Doug McAdam, who's one of the pioneers of social movement theory, wrote about in a classic article uh, decades ago, uh, tactical innovation and the pace of insurgency. So by doing something that was new, uh, that the uh, security forces uh, hadn't prepared to deal with, uh, even though it was a very small thing, uh, they were able to succeed. Um, I'm only going to refer to social media. <laughs> but, um, no, I think, I think to a large extent um, the quote-unquote success or the, uh, the size of the turnout of the mobilization on January 28th was contingent upon the turnout on previous days. So on January 25th, I mean, anybody who was in any way related to or involved with the organization of the protest on January 25th would have told you that they got numbers that they hadn't expected prior. And with the simultaneity of broadcasting and television networks on, on the ground, of course, not state television, um, of course, ended up sort of catapulting the public image of the protests uh, to a level that ha had been unanticipated. Um, and if you were to talk to the folks behind, let's say, the Kulan Khaled Saeed page and the April 6th movement, um, at that moment, on, on the night, around a little bit past midnight on January 25th, the discussion was all about uh, whether the next protest should be Friday the 28th or April 6th to commemorate the April 6th movement. And that's an interesting idea. The, obviously, the telescopic idea that you, you don't anticipate the regime to respond in the manner that they did, and you don't expect that the turnout will be as substantial as it, as it was. So on January 26th and, and 27th, uh, protesters came out without any articulated destination, without any particular location, and many of them basically rehearsed uh, exactly what had happened before, that it was essentially a performative ritualized act to come out and do exactly the same thing you did the day before. On January 26th, there was mass distribution of several documents, both online and in terms of pamphlets, uh, that um, articulated meeting spots potential meeting spots that can be repeated over and over again. And in most instances, the police literally did not have both the capacity and resources as well as the personnel to be able to literally shut down every juncture leading to the major squares. And that's, of course, on the night of January 25th, there was the recognition on the part of the protesters that made their way to Tahrir Square, that Tahrir Square would become both the epicenter of the protest movement because it is the conf I mean, it is the symbolic heart of, of downtown Cairo. It's also uh, the meeting spot for uh, the, the centers of power. I mean, you've got uh, the Mujamma, the, the Egyptian uh, museum, I mean, all kinds of symbolic meanings in that area, and it's also a very uh, accommodating space. So um, the battle on January 25th and that lasted until the, the early hours of the morning that led to the dispersal of the protesters meant that they discovered the battleground and the battleground had to be returned to. So when the internet was shut off, of course, you know, you've essentially removed the weapon of mass distraction. So if you were a slacktivist, and not only that, you have to remember that it was coupled with the shutting down of all mobile technology in Egypt. Many people had, you know, at least, you know, uh, the in, you know if internet penetration is no more than 25 to 32 percent. Uh, mobile phone tel penetration is up in the 90, uh, up in the 90 percentile. So in that case, you, you're talking about shutting down all forms of communication outside of word of mouth between people and, and landlines are becoming increasingly uh, you know, obsolete. So eventually, people came out onto the street to at least meet one another, let alone to protest. And eventually, I mean, I'll tell you, family members of mine who live in Mohandesin who had not had any interest in participating in the protest prior for fear of personal sort of risk and what have you, watched the people marching down the street and joined them because it was the only thing left to do. So, it, I mean, again, it's, it's a confluence of different things. There's really no explanation for it in some ways. Uh, but, you know, um, it, it is really essentially what, what it, I believe, you know, what I described as Clay Shirky's nightmare. I mean, in the absence of all media, all communication, technology, that the innovation is gone, you can't use, you know, the telegraph anymore in such circumstances. You're essentially either uh, a voyeur, a spectator, or you're a participant. And in many instances, people found themselves coming out and participating, and it was an incredible beauty. Now, there is also something what is described in Egyptian sort of common vernacular now uh, as amaliyat karru uh, which is basically you run, hit, run, hit, run, hit, and it was back and forth 
across various, various streets uh, all over Cairo until eventually they were able to gain ground. And the more people get hit, the more you feel like this is a sort of a communal affair. So what happens in, in sort of the human psychology, both in an individualized and a collective manner, is, is impossible to, uh, to really articulate and explain and to imagine its repeatability. Uh, in, a, in a protracted fashion. I mean, look at you know the the protests in in October and in November. The Mohammed Mahmoud, which has become an iconic spot right now for the Egyptian protest movement, and you know as far as graffiti, it's also become an epicenter for uh, for articulation of, of symbolism uh, and, uh, and and creative aesthetics. But you know the spaces that are that are part and parcel of the representation of the of the revolutionary movement are also the spaces where blood is spilled. And, uh, and they're self-perpetuating in a very, very intriguing and complicated way that in some cases may even violate uh, theoretical grounding. Thank you. Do one of you want to talk about collaboration? I don't think revolutions are time for collaboration. I just... Um, Without collaboration, there's no revolution. No, I, I think this, is a, this has been a big theme among many Egyptians all year. Um, that we need national unity. Uh, revolutions are not about national unity. Absolutely not. Two more questions. Hi, I'm Fida Adeli. I teach here at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. And I have a question for Joel. Joel, I really appreciated your presentation. Because of your previous writings, I knew about the role of labor sort of leading up to this, but not in this detail. And um, I, I was in Jordan during the Arab Spring, and I've been paying a lot of attention to what's going on there. And one of the most remarkable things is what's happening on the labor front there. I mean, last year alone, there were over 600 labor strikes in sectors anywhere from phosphates to teachers to ministry work, ministry of interior workers, imams, et cetera. And, and some of these are sort of one-shot deals, strikes, sit-ins that quickly fade, but a number of them preceded 2011. So the teachers, the phosphate workers, the electricity workers now have been organizing for over a year, and that's also sort of coinciding with the government attempts to raise prices of electricity, so they're sort of coalescing around some issues there. But I've just been amazed at, by how little attention this has gotten on anything that's written about Jordan. Um, so there's been, you know, by the folks who pay attention to Jordan, there's been a lot of analysis, but hardly, I don't think I've seen mention of this, except in the most recent ICG report about Jordan, which had some brief mention. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've been paying attention to what's going on there, and if you had any thoughts. So somebody who applied to do a PhD in history uh, at Stanford um, wrote a very nice proposal mentioning most of what you just said. Unfortunately, he wasn't accepted, but this guy knows about it very clearly. Um, so I can tell you who that is and how to get in touch with him. Uh, I, what's happening in Jordan is new for Jordan, uh, but not new if you take the category of Arab monarchies, where uh, there was a huge labor movement in Saudi Arabia in the 50s and early 60s. You can read Bob Vitalis's book, America's Kingdom, for an account of it. Uh, the labor movement in Morocco uh, was one of the most important components of the protest movement there. Uh, and it's one of the mo reasons that it can still continue at a much reduced pace. So we're not used to thinking, especially in these three countries, uh, about labor uh, as a, an important component of the, the social scene. Uh, and of course, you know, even a journal like International Labor and Working Class History uh, declared, I think it was in 1995, uh, the working class is dead. Uh, so that's not true, especially not in the global south. I mean, the, that, the, the, the collapse of manufacturing in the global north has precisely moved the scene uh, of what used to be called class struggle, but let's not be dogmatic and decide, we'll, we'll figure out what it is once it develops a little bit more. But uh, this is gonna be happening more and more. Uh, we're gonna, I mean, there's been a huge strike wave in China. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. How many times has that been on the front page of the New York Times? Even though we're buying stuff that they have interrupted making all the time. So we don't pay attention to these things because um, we're big, supporters of the neoliberal transformation of the world in the United States, but it isn't working and it isn't going to work and we should, should be on the lookout for it. Yes, 
We yes. can, yeah. Well, we could hit. We should be able to hit. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Heba Izzat. I come from Cairo University. Hi, Joel. How are you doing? Uh, I just have one comment on Adil and, uh, and, and five uh, sort of keywords for Marwan. Uh, the comment on Adil is I would like you to explore also the counter-revolution on the okay. internet. You know, because once you get in and you write a post on the Facebook or a tweet, and then you face all these sort of, you know, the, uh, the eggs on Twitter, you know, and the Facebook uh, sort of um, attacks, you know, those who come in and say you ruined the whole country, blah, blah, blah. So there is a very active network of, act of counter-revolution, and I think this should be added to your team. Regarding Maron, I found your idea very, uh, I think you can make four papers out of, <laughs> out of what you said. Uh, but I will summarize my comments on five uh, keywords. Flesh, stone. Um, letters, images, and soldiers, because the soldiers are absent. You know, in the cave, there are soldiers that are standing outside, and the body of the prisoners th uh, themselves is used, as you mentioned, and then there are the graffitis on the wall, not only the shadows, but the graffitis as well. So regarding flesh, because of the literature that you uh, that is usually used, um, let's call it either the queer theory or uh, the Foucauldian approach to the body and etc. you miss the transcendental use of the body. So it's interesting for me, maybe you didn't mean it, but you mentioned Ali Mahdi and you didn't mention the martyrs, for example, or you didn't mention the manifestation of prayer in the Midan. So the body is not only bodily, the bodily can also become a transcendental sign. Uh, I would like to add that the body has four dimensions. The body as a domain of hegemony, so killing and torture and cutting body into pieces, etc. Uh, and the ultras, not only in Syria, but we have the ultras massacre, basically, and other massacres, Muhammad Mahmoud, as you mentioned, etc. The body as a carrier, the t-shirts that the kids are now wearing, and the signs, and, the, uh, and the, the Palestinian shawl, and many other things. The body as a, in itself as a sign, and the body as mass, which is how many people are on the demonstration, which actually creates the numbers that can intimidate, and, and, uh, and that needs to be sort of faced by the government and by the soldiers, the, to, to be dispersed, the body as simply flesh, you know, so uh, I think this is important. Stone is very important because the media shifted sometimes from the uh, uh, vir virtual to the walls, but not only to the walls, I don't know whether you have seen this, but we have walls now in downtown Cairo the, the formed with blocks, you know, because of the confrontation, so we have walls in, on the streets blocking the streets. And there has been, I think it was a week ago, there was a, a sort of an exhibition. Uh, the, 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 I, I keep saying the kids, I mean the demonstrators and the revolutionaries, they had this very nice image that you can see through the wall. You know, they made it look uh, by uh, graphics, etc., as if it's transparent, that they say we're not intimidated, we can see through, and we don't, we, we don't consider the wall to be a barrier. So the walls, how they were used to put the graffiti, but what also to to be there as, as a signal and how they were challenged and sometimes the demonstrators pulled down the, the different bricks and, and opened the route. Uh, the images, uh, and uh, the images here, I will mention two examples, Kabila and al Gumhuriya TV. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about spontaneous uh, individual agent oriented, the, the subject sort of manifestation of, uh, of uh, opinion or position, but it's also the product that produced sort of the production of images through alternative media, which can be added. The letters are very important and how we shifted from, Ara from English actually into Arabic. Twitter is more Arabic after the evolution than it was at least the Egyptian, the use of Egyptians of the Twitter. Uh, and, uh, and how the letter is also used in terms of that the virtual, and this is in the industry of publication now increasingly. I was, I was talking to a friend who is a philosopher and uh, uh, I'm, I'm 
I'm thinking that the, now more and more books are now based on tweets and are based on, on, on blogs, uh, rather than a full text that is written, and they sell more probably than novels. So how this relation, actually, not only the formal and the informal media or alternative media, the virtual and the, and the institutional organized media, but also how the, the virtual becomes a form of a written word and published on paper and sold around to have its impact on how the different genres of writing are affected. Thank you. Um, th thank you for bringing up the, uh, the counter-revolutionary militias and what they do uh, online. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the, count I mean, the, t the term counter-revolutionary, of course, imply, you know, paints all these groups in, in a broad brushstroke. Of course, they are very, very different in more ways than one. There are some that are extremely loyal to the old regime. Some of them are representative of uh, various security uh, apparatus, and, uh, and there are those who, um, who are sort of uh, recently politicized groups or groups who um, are very much supportive of the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces. So it's a very divergent uh, group. But nevertheless, the, uh, the counter-revolutionary militias on the social media are, are actually extremely um, sort of clunky in the manner in which they use the medium. Uh, so in most cases, you'll find that their profiles are very slim. There's not much information. Uh, they tend not to distribute, uh, you know, both information and ideas and, and discourses with adeptness. Uh, they also don't understand the language of the social media very well, um, uh, and they're extremely transparent. Uh, they tend to do this very much like a, a full-time job, almost like uh, taking shifts, like nine to five shifts. So, uh, and there's um, an overwhelming amount of bombardment of messages. So they'll, uh, they'll just enter a specific page or, uh, or access a specific uh, status, let's say, a status upset, uh, update on Facebook and launch into a, sort of a, a full attack by reposting with as, as much frequency as they possibly can the same message over and over again. Uh, by, and in doing so, they, they attract attention to their message and they increase the possibility of, uh, of exposure. But nevertheless, I think for the most part, uh, they end up falling on, on deaf ears because, um, again, uh, in, in an environment where there's a slow sort of disintegration of, um, of authoritarian um, fear uh, or fear of authoritarianism and a growing acceptance of a, a, a loss of anonymity, uh, these individuals tend not to be particularly transparent. Uh, and the absence of transparency uh, arouses a tremendous amount of skepticism, not just from the revolutionary groups, but from the bystanders, the individuals who are just watching and, and, and following. So it doesn't seem as though they're particularly successful at swaying people. Nevertheless, the discourses, I would argue that the revolutionary discourses that are far more powerful are the ones that are being propagated in the state media. Uh, and in other sort of uh, broadcast media, the more sort of, I hate to use the terminology like traditional media, but the uh, non-online spaces or the uh, non-virtual uh, platforms. Uh, but uh, again, you know, they, it is, this process harkens back to the uh, Mubarak uh, era approach. If you were to look at the Kulina Khaled Said website, uh, or sorry, Facebook page specifically, you will see that there's a recurring appearance of specific individuals. Uh, many of them have, you know, uh, um, uh, you, you, you gave the example of the egg. You know, the, the egg is a signifier of an individual uh, who doesn't, hasn't taken either the time or, or invested the energy to put a profile photo on their Twitter feed. So that, of course, indicates that they are either novices or that they, uh, they're particularly opaque about their identity. And the same applies with uh, people who post uh, individuals or, uh, in, for most part, one could call them bots, you know, or cyber, uh, cyber bots uh, that are performing the activity but not really engaging in a discourse. And the absence of an engagement in discourse uh, is, for the most part, uh, an, an assured way to not uh, get anywhere in the social media. You have to be able to engage in the deliberative process of trying to win over um, you know, the, the online community, if one were to describe it as such. Of course, it's a very fragmented community, but it is, uh, to a large extent, a deliberative space, no different from the interpersonal communicative space. Uh, and in the absence of that, the sort of simple copy-paste grafting of messages uh, seems to indicate that the security apparatus, as well as its foot soldiers in the social media, uh, just haven't learned to play the game just right. But I imagine that they will, they will become increasingly more capable uh, as time goes on, that there is sort of a, a learning curve. Uh, they've come a long way in, in 11 months or 12 months, and I imagine they will continue to do so.
I, I, I want to thank you for, for the comments you made, and I, I think you, you have a couple of papers there yourself. Um, but, but I, you know, there's an incident that I wanted to tell, and I, I ran out of time, uh, ending the paper. Um, so one of the times when I, when I was um, I'm doing some work in Egypt, um, on the gate of the Arab League headquarters. You know, there's the Yemeni tent on one side and the Syrian tent on, on one side. And I spent some time at the Yemeni tent on one of the days. And at some point, you know, we had talked and talked and talked. At this point, you know, would you mind if I take some pictures, if I take some videos? So they said, no. I grab my iPhone. As I'm taking pictures of them, I see two of them grabbing one a Blackberry, one a camera, taking pictures and video of me taking pictures and video of them. And, um, and so, and, and the, the, the point afterwards, I realized, was this was not about them actually documenting anything, but rather making the point that, you know, the, the, the agency to represent and communicate resides equally with us, you know, so you're taking pictures of us. We're not inanimate objects, right? We are taking pictures of you. Then I turn around like this, and I see two men standing outside on the sidewalk taking pictures with phones of us taking pictures of each other. And I said, and I said, and who the heck are these? And they said, you know, the one guy who was like, who was my kind of, you know, the main person I was, I was talking to said, who knows, who cares? But the point was that the two guys outside were also sending a message by their bodily presence. They could be taking, they could be across the street, you know, un under the, uh, uh, the, the, the mujamma. With, with cameras with a tiny zoom, and they would be taking the same pictures. But that was not the point. The point was bodily presence raises the stake. When you use the body as, as a medium in any kind of, of political context, you raise the stakes. Right? So that, that's the point I was trying to make.